Hello, my name is Ken Tate. I'm a professor at the University of California, Davis, uh, in the Department of Plant Sciences. Today I'm going to talk with you about the science of grazing management and water quality on rangeland watersheds, um, which occupy about 50% of the state of California and much of the western U.S. In California, over 80% of our surface waters are derived from or stored on rangeland watersheds. Um, we, as a society, use these waters um, for drinking, um, for irrigating crops such as fresh produce crops, and for habitat for anadromous fish such as coho salmon and other uh, aquatic species. Concerns exist about water, about water quality pollution due to livestock grazing on these lands. The types of pollutants that are raising concerns are microbial pollutants such as Cryptosporidium parvum and E. coli, which potentially can be pathogenic, that is, they'll cause illness in humans if ingested at high enough concentrations. Uh, we're concerned about nutrients like nitrogen and phosphorus, and if we have too much nitrogen and phosphorus loaded to certain water bodies and streams, we essentially over-fertilize them, and that can cause a process called eutrophication to occur, and when, when waters become eutrophied, there's inadequate oxygen to support fish and other in-stream um, species. We're concerned about microbial and fecal pollutants, um, primarily from fecal um, and urine wastes from livestock being deposited in or near uh, these water bodies, or those pollutants being transported from deposition in the upland areas via runoff to these water bodies. The last uh, constituent that we're concerned about when it comes to, to livestock grazing is erosion and the sediment that's generated from that. Um, too much sediment entering a stream that supports fish can clog um, breeding gravels and other habitat that's essential for those aquatic species uh, to reproduce and flourish. As an example of some of these concerns, to give you some idea of the policy arena that they exist in, um, in the past there was substantial concern in the Bay Area about the potential for Cryptosporidium parvum, which is a, a protozoa pathogen that can create illness in humans, which is not easily filtered out of water at a treatment plant, entering the human drinking chain um, and causing risk to, to um, compromise, immunocompromised individuals within our communities. And so within the Bay Area, much of the drinking water that is provided comes from lands that have livestock grazing them, and there are benefits from that grazing, such as fuel reduction to reduce the risk to wildfire. But there's also concerns about um, these um, pathogens. This issue was resolved, and you can see from some of these uh, news clippings that this happened a while ago, um, but these types of concerns persist today. So trying to provide information to help policymakers, managers, and others address these, these important issues on our rangelands, um, there's a couple decades worth of supporting science that have been developed in the state of California and across the western U.S. Um, on rangelands and grazing and water quality. And this is kind of be summed up into three categories, basically research about the different types of pollutant sources and uh, contributions on grazing lands, Information about the transport and fate and mitigation of these pollutants once they've been deposited on the landscape by livestock, do they survive? Are they transported with water? Where do they end up? Uh, how long do they persist? And then what are the resulting water quality conditions, clean or dirty, um, on these rangelands? So I think about this body of research kind of as a line of research from source of pollutant down to water quality conditions that result from the different processes that occur between a pollutant being deposited on the landscape or generated um, until it ar arrives in a water body that somebody might recreate in or might drink from. So if we think about range and water pollutants of concern, which I described a bit briefly, um, we have clearly in these grazed landscape livestock sources that potentially can generate these pollutants. But these are mixed landscapes where we have other land uses occurring. So there's other sources of these potential pollutants out there that we have to account for, wildlife species, et cetera. And then there's background or natural levels. You know, erosion is an example, is a natural process. So the generation of sediment is a natural process. Our concerns is if we're elevating the uh, levels of erosion that are occurring above background due to our activities. And so there's been work done to try and understand these sources. Um, and then there's 
been work done to understand once these sources are out on the landscape, what is their potential for transport and what is their environmental fate dynamics? As I described earlier, do they live or die? Um, and how long does that take? And then based on the transport and environmental fate dynamics that occur, irregardless of the source of a particular pollutant, there's the resulting water quality conditions. We as managers um, have the opportunity at this step to in provide intervention or management solutions that mitigate pollutants that might be from our sources, whether it be livestock production or some other type of, of human activity. Um, it's at this point where we can intervene with management solutions to maintain high water quality conditions by basically um, con disconnecting, if you will, the source from the um, sink via uh, transport or survival. And so some of the work that we've done, we've found, for instance, at Cryptosporidium parvum, the protozoa that I spoke of earlier in, in the Bay Area with, uh, that was of concern, uh, Cryptosporidium levels in cattle actually, upon study, were found to be quite low. And the species of Cryptosporidium that exist in livestock have limited risk of creating illness in humans, which is an excellent finding. Um, but one which was not in place, you know, 20 years ago. So for instance, we've studied cryptosporidium in both wildlife and livestock across this landscape. If you take range beef cattle, we've studied hundreds if not thousands of range beef cattle, sampled them to see if they're infected with this pathogen, and found that less than 5% are infected across our rangeland herds. Um, we actually find higher levels of incidence of this particular disease in young calves, less than four months of age, 10 to 20 percent. We find no infected backcountry pack stock or, or horses or mules. We find these pathogens in many, many, many wildlife species, including feral pig and ground squirrel. So there are many sources out there across the landscape for this particular pollutant, um, all of them at somewhat low levels, but all of them potential um, contributors. If we think about and discuss a bit some of the research that we've done, trying to understand the transport and fate dynamics of some of these pollutants, we've found that less than 10% of microbial pollutants um, that are in livestock fecal deposits um, are mobilized by rainfall and runoff. That is, over 90% of these pollutants are stuck in the fecal pad where they were deposited. So if we think about it, the entire range, the entire hill slope is a microbial filter. If we think about a fecal pat from a cow or a sheep or some other livestock being deposited on a typical rangeland hill slope um, upstream from a water body, um, and we have rainfall events, first thing we know is that over the course of that wet season, the course of the period that that fecal pat's out there, over 90% of the pollutants are trapped in that fecal pat, whether it be E. coli or Cryptosporidium parvum. So huge reduction right there. We find that for each additional yard that a pollutant has to travel downslope from the fecal pad as runoff during, say, a rainstorm or some type of runoff event, we find an additional 70 to 99% of what is released um, is trapped. And then we find that once that pathogen or that pollutant does reach a stream or a water body, an additional 30 to 70 percent of that is trapped within riparian areas. So these, these systems are extremely good at filtering, if you will, or attenuating these pollutants as they flow through the system. We have found recently similar findings for many of the pharmaceuticals that are used within grazing livestock as well as some natural and um, synthetic hormones that are used within these livestock. The same type of uh, filtering capacity across this landscape. We found, looking at cryptosporidium, that the eggs, the oocyst of cryptosporidium, will die within one day if air temperature gets to be 78 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. Um, this is actually, a, 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 the eggs actually hatch within the fecal pad as the temperature of that fecal pad goes up to 104 degrees in sunlight on a day achieving 78 degree um, air temperature, and the eggs hatch, and they hatch in a hostile environment and, and perish. So that, that helps us think about you know, these pathogens that might be being deposited out on an arid landscape in California during the summer or the fall or the late spring. Many of those pathogens are actually attenuated um, directly within the fecal pat the day they are deposited. 
Um, so that helps us understand that we can use timing of grazing near sensitive areas um, to allow the rangeland, if you will, to autoclave or um, cleanse itself with the temperature disinfectant. And we've, we've looked into management solutions and have found that there's, there's definitely a toolbox of practices that we've been able to demonstrate effectiveness for protecting water quality, livestock production, ranching systems on these rangelands and grazed watersheds. So if we think about range management that reduces pollution, um, there are a couple things that we need to accomplish. And there are tools to do that. But one of the first things we need to do, we know that stocking rate, the number of livestock per unit land per acre, uh, per unit time, say over the course of a year, is a primary determinant of how livestock management is going to affect almost any environmental outcome, including water quality. So we need to set stocking rate in balance with forage production and the resiliency of the site to withstand the potential negative effects of grazing, which could be compaction of the soil due to hoof um, uh, action. And so we need to accomplish that, and that needs to be site-specific, because some sites are more resilient, some sites are less resilient. But setting a good, solid, moderate stocking rate is the first step. Then we need to think about where livestock are on the landscape. So we need to manage livestock spatial distribution. We need to distribute grazing and waste across the landscape and actively manage grazing intensity in critical hydrologic zones. Remember that we have huge potential on rangelands for them to filter microbes that are being carried in runoff, and we need to make that runoff distance as great as possible. So basically we're trying to increase the distance um, between where livestock waste is deposited relative to water bodies of concern. And then we have to think about the timing of where livestock are in these critical landscapes and manage their distribution during, during the wet season. So when you think about how we distribute livestock to more resilient soils and areas of the ranch and to non-critical hydrologic zones during saturated periods, because during saturated periods we see the greatest potential for pollutants and livestock waste to be transported to water bodies that we do not want them to occur in. So think about the tools to achieve these management goals. Uh, prescribed grazing, which is managing the timing, intensity, frequency of grazing in various management units. The use of cross-fencing to allow us to get better control of livestock access to, say, critical hydrologic zones um, so that we can manage when and where livestock are. Whenever we start creating fencing and trying to move livestock away from streams and other areas that might be their drinking water, we may need to develop off-site or off-stream drinking water sources. Um, thinking about where we place supplemental feeding uh, stations where we might feed hay or where we might put salt and other supplements out. Obviously, we should put those away from water bodies. The use of riparian pastures, again, with cross-fencing. Herding is a tool that can work effectively. And the creation and use of vegetative filter strips, which can basically be used to buffer uh, runoff that may be coming off of grazed areas um, where necessary. All of these tools will work um, in, in most locations. And so management solutions, um, moderate stocking, things such as off-stream drinking water and cross-fencing used together as a toolbox. There's not one of these that will work by itself completely. Together they can work as a cumulative benefit and they need to be arranged in a way that um, works most effectively and most logistically straightforwardly um, on every ranch. So kind of completing this line of research then, we have strong evidence that with good management, clean water, recreation, grazing, and other types of activities on these landscapes are indeed very compatible. Um, risks can occur, but there are management tools in place to mitigate that risk um, when implemented correctly. So in summary, management can certainly create risk to water quality. But management can also protect water quality. Setting clean water and water quality protection as one of your, one of your core management goals is an essential process. Rangelands have great capacity to attenuate pollutants from livestock and other ranch activities, and we should work with that potential. The capacity that these lands have to cleanse water flowing through them is immense, and we should enhance that potential wherever possible with good management. 
And then we need to recall that there's a large toolbox of tested feasible practices that exist that can be used to keep uh, water quality high on these grazing lands. And we need to think of these tools as a toolbox. Um, there is no magic or no silver bullet that's going to work everywhere and work 100%. We use this toolbox collectively and it gives us the best chance to provide the cleanest water possible off of the lands that we're managing. Thank you. You can find more informative presentations covering ranch water quality topics on the UC Rangelands website and look for the Water Quality Information Hub or direct your web browser to the URL shown on this slide.